I'm going to try to convince you by the time I'm done that the diseases that you're all interested in studying, um, have studied for years, um, actually contribute much more to the things that bring people to physicians' offices and medical centers than is appreciated. So that's, that's really the premise I want to leave you with. I first want to say how honored I am to be invited to this, and um, in particular because the scholar and gentleman for whom this lecture is named is a longtime friend and colleague, um, but also because I'm very interested in learning from you all at this meeting. This is not my regular space. I'm, I've been more in the common disease, uh, polygenic architecture space. Um, but I've become so convinced about the relationship between rare and common diseases um, that I, I have a lot to learn, and I'm really looking forward to that at this meeting. So we, as, as uh, Matt said, I've been doing most of my work of late through biobanks, which are just collections of specimens from many individuals linked to phenome, um, which may be through electronic health records, but it may come through, um, as with the UK Biobank and some of the other European biobanks, a couple of days of data collection, so everything that is relatively cheap and easy to measure in a couple of days, um, or some combination of that coupled to electronic health record information. And then we usually um, also collect some kinds of omics data, um, genome variation, uh, whether uh, cheap biobanking chips, exome and whole genome sequencing. Uh, more and more, at least subsets of data may be measured for transcriptomics, metabolomes, methylomes. Um, but it's also possible for the, these um, other omics that are heritable to be imputed in. And that's basically what we do in our biobank, BioView, in which we have DNA samples on about 250,000 subjects linked to electronic health records that are really high quality. So uh, Vanderbilt built their own electronic health records now almost 30 years ago. On average, for people in the biobank, we have 10 to 15 years of electronic health records. And a 41-member Department of Biomedical Informatics filled with physician scientists um, medical informaticists who really know how to create um, an infrastructure that can be used by, by those of us who are not physicians or medical informaticists to really do research with this information. And, and we do that not just with the 250,000 samples that we have DNA on, but we have a lot of opportunity with the 2.8 million on whom we have electronic health records going back so long to augment and iterate between the genetic and just the phenomic data. We've imputed in transcriptome and now are imputing in metabolomes um, to the subjects on whom we have genetic data. And, and I would argue that, so biobanks are, are amazing resources. Yes, the, because of the sample size, they can contribute to genome-wide association studies and the burgeoning number of sequencing studies being done uh, in human subjects. But our forte really is being able to go from genetics, so coding variants, function-rich omics, gene-based studies, to the phenome. Because you're going, you have the whole medical phenome rather than just slices of disease. And I think that gives you uh, an opportunity to ask different kinds of questions. Um, so we do this by, uh, for the transcriptomics, for example, using um, GTEx, where we have measured gene expression through RNA-seq um, now in, in, more, in about 900 subjects. Um, and you can build predictive models from that that, that focus on the genetically regulated part of gene expression. So, of course, um, a lot of what we measure when we measure gene expression in, in this outer circle um, is not the consequences of genetic variation, but local exposures, long-term exposures, uh, recent exposures, like whether you uh, had some caffeine at lunch, um, impact on gene expression broadly, and then over time, the diseases and traits that we develop feed back on, so we have a trait-altered component of gene expression as well. And that's, 
That's why measured gene expression is so challenging to interpret with respect to causality because there's always thousands of genes significantly differentially expressed between cases and controls in, in the context of any later onset disease phenotype. And most of that is a consequence of this ongoing disease process, not a contributing cause to disease. Um, whereas when we focus on just the genetically regulated part of gene expression, those that we can predict from DNA variants, um, then we're, we're good. And we get high quality prediction performance for now with uh, version 8 GTEx, uh, actually clo closer to 20,000 genes and long non-coding RNAs in at least some tissues. So, and then you can test the association of this genetically predicted gene expression to the medical phenome. Um, and again, that's not tens of thousands of ICD-9 and 10 codes. We boil it down into um, about uh, 1,100 to 1,900 phenome codes, depending on your sample size. So actually with our sample sizes, we're still at about 1,100 phenome codes that you can interrogate with any power plus all of the quantitative biomarkers um, that are collected. So that you end up with this gene by medical phenome catalog that really is a, a fantastic discovery engine for not just discovering new relationships between genes and medical phenome, but giving you some insights into primary mechanisms of disease. So the sort of upstream physiology to what you're looking at Imagine seeing you know, two different genes related to uh, lipid levels, myocardial infarction, uh, the, the consequences of myocardial infarction, one with other phenome associated to lots of, of lipid traits, um, the other to inflammatory biology. So you might start to get some insights into different mechanisms. So this gene-based phenome-wide association study, which is what we do with the transcriptomics, um, is really asking a different question. It's basically, we're asking, what does this gene do across the entire medical phenome? Or more precisely, what does the natural variation in the expression of this gene associate with across the medical phenome? And we really do see this continuum from Mendelian to complex disease that I, I want to bring you along on. And, and I think there is a continuum that runs from loss of function mutations to deleterious amino acid polymorphisms to just reduced expression of genes um, that allow Mendelian genes, genes that contribute to rare diseases, to also contribute to the common features of those same diseases. Every rare disease is often a particular cluster of more commonly observed phenotypes, but they may be present from birth and all present in the majority of those affected. And, and the opportunities for those genes to be contributing, variation in um, the expression of those genes or for mildly deleterious alleles to increase risk of many of those same features in other people, I think is something that, that through biobanks, it's easier to see. So the first story I'm gonna tell is a, a fish story. Um, came from our zebrafish core, where they had observed, um, they had actually cloned a gene for uh, what they call the craniofacial anomaly in zebrafish. And they really wanted to see what other human phenotypes might be associated with that. So they wanna know what phenome is associated to the reduced expression of this gene um, in humans. So this is the zebrafish, the consequences of the zebrafish mutation. These are the wild type zebrafish and you see this nicely rounded uh, cranium here with the, the much flattened one here. Um, the zebrafish are also shorter um, and uh, due to uh, mutations in this gene RIC1, which um, there was already some literature suggesting uh, that this would be a protein involved in the trafficking of of large proteins through the um, endoplasmic reticulum. And in fact, um, it, it forms a protein machine with a second gene that basically rolls up the largest fibrillar collagens, 
perhaps other proteins, but certainly the fibrillar collagens, like the old um, film cassettes that we used to use for, for cameras back in the day when we still used cameras, and then, then just rolls that out through the ER. The, the fibrillar collagens are just too big to be moved through the endoplasmic reticulum in the traditional ways. And so this, the other protein that partners with RIC1, um, they deliberately knocked out to learn the phenotype. Whoops, I got these out of order. So um, they were able to show quite clearly that the RIC1 protein leads to fibrillar collagens um, being retained in the cells rather than distributed out. So you really, they just can't get out of the cells, the, the biggest fibrillar collagens. And you see um, the consequences of that uh, throughout collagen accumulation in notochord sheath cells, um, in the mutants versus the wild type, in chondrocytes, um, and, and then, so all of the things that fibrillar collagens do will be compromised um, in subjects without uh, RIC1. They deliberately knocked out the other uh, protein that would um, form the other part of this protein machine. The ph phenotype in the fish is very similar, so short, uh, with the flattened face, and similar um, molecularly as well, again with the fibrillar collagens stuck inside the cells rather than nicely moving to the peripheries. So, so that, was, that was what they came to us with. And so we looked for the BioView phenome associated to reduced genetically predicted expression of RIC1 and RGP1, which included um, bone phenotypes, so fracture, connective tissue disorders, um, not surprisingly, uh, tooth development and eruption. So the, the teeth, so uh, reported to be late developing and late erupting. We saw heart valve defects and heart valve disorders. The cartilage that's important in making up heart valves, um, it has major components from the fibrillar collagens. We saw dyschromias, um, skin conditions of uh, melanocyte deposition, um, and presume that the fibrillar collagens in the skin help to distribute more evenly the melanocytes. Um, we were, I was quite puzzled to see malabsorption syndromes and vitamin and mineral deficiencies, um, some ulceration for esophageal um, and gut. And we saw organ prolapse, which um, I think of as a disorder of extracellular matrix, so the, the fibrillar collagens help to cross-link and stabilize, strengthen extracellular matrix. And we, and we saw, um, in particular, ADHD and um, pervasive developmental delay as phenotypes associated, even in just the first 10,000 BioView subjects that we looked at, but the bigger the sample size got um, with genome interrogation, the more neuropsychiatric disorders um, we saw associated. And there is a brain extracellular matrix as well, um, and so, this is a potential model now for, for looking at some of those kinds of things. They went back to the zebrafish, and they also see evidence of, of connective tissue disorders. Um, they, the zebrafish often don't have tooth eruption at all. Um, they, their teeth are quite late in erupting if they erupt. Um, zebrafish have different, they don't use heart valves. They have a, peristaltic uh, action of the heart, so that we, there's no valve disorders to see. Um, but they definitely have dyschromias also. Um, and the zebrafish move food very fast through their digestive system, consistent with the malabsorption and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, and they also have organs that are displaced and moving around in places they're not normally found. Um, and of course, as I say, we can't, we're actually getting some, they're, they're, they've ordered some equipment to do some behavioral studies, um, but they can look at brain development, and they're doing that now. And at about this time, uh, there was a paper published from uh, colleagues in Saudi Arabia reporting mutations in RIC1, homozygous mutations in RIC1, reported with a syndrome described as um, having craniofacial anomalies, um, 
pediatric cataracts, and developmental delay. And we were able to get some fibroblasts from one of the patients that showed the same kind of cellular defect with collagen sequestered in the cells um, rather than being able to move into the periphery. So we went, we were able to go back and ask um, Falzan, can you bring the patients back in to look for some of the other phenome that we've seen in BioView patients and in the fish? And so they actually did bring the kids back in for what they called a guided reevaluation of the phenotype. And indeed, although it wasn't initially reported, the kids do have evidence of connective tissue disorders. Teeth are very late erupting. They don't get some of their teeth at all. And the teeth that do erupt um, decay very rapidly and, and, um, and often then have to be pulled. Um, we don't know if they'll develop valve disorders. There wasn't evidence of that yet. They do have the same kinds of dyschromias uh, that we had seen in the biobank and in the fish. And when asked, it turns out, um, the kids were described as having six bowel movements a day and moving whole food through their digestive systems, which was not um, immediately obvious. Um, we don't know whether there'll be any kind of organ prolapse, um, but in addition to developmental delay, uh, which the kids all had, uh, they had really severe um, ADHD, uh, sufficiently severe that it was very hard for the physicians to do the examinations. So this is an example of the correspondence uh, between a statistical association to phenome through just genetically predicted reduced expression of genes, the phenomes seen in then what became a Mendelian condition because of discoveries, and phenomes seen in a model system um, that was actually the driver of all of the observations. And, and I think, um, so first, first notch in the set of evidence for the possibility that the causes of rare diseases contribute to some of those same phenotypic features um, in, in a variety of conditions that being, bring people to medical attention. In uh, March of, or April of 2018, we published a paper about this concept of phenome risk scores, which was really um, just a way to capture, so initially conceived as a way to capture Mendelian phenome in a systematic way so that we could search for patients with undiagnosed Mendelian conditions. So you basically, just the way we, we talk in polygenic um, architecture about gene genetic risk scores, we're really just summing the phenome to create scores for individuals onto how, how well they match the phenotype described um, for given Mendelian conditions. And you can see that for many Mendelian conditions, there's a very a strong difference between the score that people diagnosed with the disease accumulates um, versus controls, um, at, with the phenylketonuria example being the, the canonical and expected one where we don't see such differences because we screen at birth for this condition and then ameliorate the risks for the actual phenotypes by altering the diet. <clears throat> now we were able to build phenome risk scores for only about 2,000 Mendelian conditions because the described features are so sparse um, that we can't get decent scores. And so one of the things that um, we're learning is that the using the electronic health record to describe the features may be a much richer way uh, to, to learn that. So now a story using um, the described phenome for Vactorol in a phenome risk score approach. So Vactorol is a really interesting disease um, with multiple congenital anomalies. Um, and, but of course, anyone with multiple congenital anomalies ends up with a lot of consequences to those congenital anomalies. So when we look, so they did a, a, an exhaustive examination of physician notes 
for all patients with a Vactoral diagnosis and all subjects with Vactoral in the physician notes and determined um, with, with the help of a medical geneticist, um, so in the 2.8 million, who really had a Vactoral diagnosis and then developed a phenome risk score for all of the phenome associated with Vactoral. Now because the weights for this um, phenome risk score reflect how rare or common the condition is in the electronic health record, the highest weight phenotypes are all of the congenital anomalies. But most of the phenome that goes into this descriptor um, were highly significant associations to the downstream consequences of having congenital anomalies. Um, that said, the weight given to all of that downstream phenotype is relatively low compared to the weight that would come to the congenital anomalies because they're so rare um, in the electronic health records. But here's the distribution of that score um, in genotyped individuals. Um, so this is, this is the distribution of the phenome risk score for Vactoral, driven a lot by subjects that have multiple congenital anomalies. And so here's the... Here's just the, what we call the Fifi was. So what phenome is associated to the phenome risk score for Vactoral? And the congenital anomalies here, because they're rare, they don't reach the same level of statistical significance as some of their consequences, um, but, but they all come up um, highly significantly associated. I mean, this is, this is all really highly significantly associated phenome. So the genes associated to this Vactoral VRS, um, many highly significantly associated genes. Um, so just the, the top ones are shown here for the Vactoral VRS. Um, and I'm, so I'm going to go through what's interesting about some of these genes. We were looking in particular for the possibility that a couple of genes highlighted in some uh, studies uh, in a recent New England Journal article uh, might be contributory. And they were number 22 and 23 on sort of the list of genes, so not in the very top, but, you know, barely nominally significantly associated. But some of the other genes are quite interesting. So um, there's evidence for, um, so early lethality and defects in skin, immune, and male reproductive systems um, for one of the top genes uh, on the list. Similarly, uh, paternal factors and embryonic development. Um, for one of these genes, uh, as shown here. Also, um, Miller syndrome uh, here, a Miller syndrome gene, and, and a little bit of G by E here, so a gene that is a uh, receptor for toxoplasma, toxoplasmosis. Um, so so this, this we're going to be following up extensively through physician notes to see, and in, and in diagnoses to see whether uh, toxoplasmosis infections were identified or characterized um, in these pregnancies. Uh, but the point is there's a lot of genetic signal associated with a score that is aggregating um, congenital anomalies. And and getting hits at some genes where we already know rare variants can drive these things. We're looking at the genetically predicted reduced expression of those genes to see this phenome in a biobank. Um, and of course, this is not, uh, some, not all these subjects are pediatric subjects. Some of them are adults with multiple congenital anomalies no intellectual disability, um, but, but they're living with the consequences of those congenital anomalies. We took all of the genes that have been reported for cardiac congenital anomalies, just broke them out separately, and, and collected the phenome. And so the size of the word here reflects the number of different genes in which this was a significantly associated phenotype. Uh, you know, the, the, so you see tricuspid, and someplace around here you'll see valve, um, you get heart and cardiac. So just with the reduced expression of genes reported to lead to cardiac congenital anomalies, you see a, a lot of interesting biology 
So there's kidney and bladder. Um, some of these associated with multiple congenital anomalies. Um, you pick up things like so a variety of valve conditions, um, the use of shunts, cardiac shunts, uh, septal defects. Um, but we get, uh, we get liver, there's kidney along here, uh, diabetes, um, asthma. There, there are other consequences to some of these genes that are pretty consistent across multiple of the genes. Um, and if you have more subtle cardiac congenital anomalies, not picked up at birth, not something that causes a great deal of difficulty until later life um, when you might pick up some of these cardiac and heart conditions in earlier onset of heart failure, for example. So I think in small letters somewhere you'll see um, preserved ejection fraction and, and not preserved ejection fraction. So again, the, the same kinds of genes may be contributing because they, they lead to just subtle differences in developing hearts um, to later onset disease. Now, just throwing a little wrinkle into how to interpret all of this are the results for CFTR, which are shown here. So you see the reduced genetically predicted expression of CFTR is highly significantly associated, uh, p-value in the, you know, p-value of effectively zero to cystic fibrosis, and all of the EHR-based features of cystic fibrosis, every single one of them. And with, with pretty impressive p-values for many of them. Now we know that reduced expression of CFTR can't cause cystic fibrosis. It's caused by mutations in the CFTR gene. And in European populations, and this is all from European individuals in our biobank, um, that's mostly due to mutations in delta F508, and there's a handful of others relatively common also. And it turns out that when you look at the haplotypic background in which the delta F508 allele is present, that's shown in red against the genetically predicted expression of CFTR. So the delta F508 allele, we have a good LD proxy for, um, it's just a little more common than delta F508, about twice as frequent, and you see the R squared of 0.4, but D prime is one. Delta F508 alleles are, are invariably found on some of the lowest expressing, certainly the most common low expressing haplotype that we observe at CFTR. So each, this is about uh, 900 haplotypes being described here, 440 some carriers. Uh, I thought I had it listed, but it's about 440 some carriers, oh, 448 carriers. Um, with the delta F508 allele shown in red, and then the other allele shown in black, and you can see most commonly the other allele is a very high expressing allele, um, but we have other, other haplotypes present as well with, um, with lower expression. And so the reason that we can see those associations to cystic fibrosis is that the lowest expressing haplotypes all, I mean, not all carry, but, but all CF mutations, all common CF mutations are found ex almost exclusively. So there's, there's two that are found on high expressing backgrounds. Um, all of the rest are found on some of the lowest expressed haplotypes in CFTR. So, so that, that explains why we observe what we observe, but it raises the question of how that is, why that is. Um, one potential model is that uh, 
that the carriers of mutations survive better when they're when they happen to have arisen on a low expressing background. Um, so that there's on average more wild type than mutant protein produced. So, um, and that, so we can see in CF patients that the, uh, the allele carrying delta F508 um, is the lowest expressed of the three. Um, but that's also true in controls. Um, so the lowest expressed relative to the others. Um, and we only have seven carriers in GTEx, um, but yeah, but they have notably lower expression. And um, you, you see the same effect uh, for uh, this, that same haplotype, um, but without the delta 508 mutation, it's also expressed at essentially the same levels. We created a phenome risk score from the CF EHR phenotypes um, phenome because we wanted to test whether that would allow us to detect a burden of disease in carriers. That's something that would be consistent with the observations that we have. If there's any phenome to even just carrying CF mutations, in the era before antibiotics, that, that carriers would have been strongly selected against, perhaps unless the mutation was present on a really low expressing background, where most of the time there's going to be more, much more wild type than mutant protein. And indeed, when we use this um, phenome risk score built from the uh, patient phenome, we actually observe uh, an ability to distinguish the phenome in carriers from, from the phenome in homozygotes. Uh, and, and better than the described clinical phenome. So, so that's part of the between the spaces story. But, but another part, and I alluded to earlier with the toxoplasmosis, is getting more about the environment and the importance of doing that. Most common diseases are about not just the genetics but also environment. We need more information on in utero, early life, and later life exposures. But the E part of this also reflects stochastic factors that the, the stochastic part of brain development, of synaptic pruning, the stochastic part of how the immune system develops um, and the consequences of that for, for later onset diseases. The stochastic part, you can't, you can't really ever get to prediction of. But you can often develop ways of measuring the consequences of the stochastic development um, that has happened. And so some of the brain imaging studies that the UK Biobank is going to have just fantastic data on as the sample of subjects with brain imaging increases. But even measurements made, for example, of the immunome can give us information on some of the consequences of the stochastic parts of, of E that may be predictive of disease. And we can also use genome variation to help us see this space too. If you wanted to capture information on the consequences of Western diet and lifestyle that we know contribute to many diseases, <laughs> you could just condition measured LDL on the genetic predict, genetically predicted LDL and measured BMI on genetically predicted BMI and um, uh, fatty liver disease on genetically predicted fatty liver disease. And part of what that, that residual phenotype is capturing is the non-genetic components. Part of what it's capturing apparently is rare variation contributing as well. But but you're, you've got some way of coalescing some of that environment in the sort of oppositional space to the contribution made by genome variation to measurements that we make that have both genetic and environmental components. And we can certainly build this out even further 
with additional omics. Um, phenomics, for example, to, to look at phenome correlations against bivariate heritability at scale across the EHR and find phenotypes with little evidence for shared genetic architecture, but strong phenome correlations. And you never know. If mesothelioma is one of those phenotypes, you might suspect asbestos as, your, as a, a contributory exposure. There's, there may be all kinds of ways to learn about those things through comprehensive study of phenome correlations against shared genetic architecture. Somatic mutations, the, the things that we're learning about how um, you know, this clonal hematopoiesis can increase risk of uh, a lot of, of downstream medical phenome. We have transcriptomics, epigenomics, um, translational efficiency. All of, we need all of that on many cell types to sort of build out ways to better see and incorporate information on this space um, between the things that we are measuring. So what medical phenome might be associated with the methylation signature detected with cigarette smoking? We know what smoking causes, but this methylation signature is a very long-lived thing. It decays only slowly, like the risk for some cancers and um, some of the heart-based uh, cardiovascular uh, disease that's attributable to cigarette smoking. And so it seemed interesting and prudent to try to learn what that phenome might be. So we used reference data um, with methylation status at sites variably methylated that was measured uh, in smokers and non-smokers, and then in additional data learned the relationship between the methylation signature and genes expressions. Um, and then use that to create scores in BioView to identify people whose natural genetic variation in the genes most impacted by this methylation signature are most similar to that of the signature. And so across the brain region so far, the strongest associations are with um, alcoholism, alcoholic liver damage, alcohol-related disorders, um, and then you get down into schizophrenia and psychosis with, uh, so the upward arrow means associated uh, with increased risk um, related to this methylation signature. So um, that's really interesting phenome. These are not smokers. These are people whose genetically predicted expression of genes in the brain is most similar to what happens with this methylation signature. And so our interpretation of this might be, um, if it holds up as we uh, triple the sample size here, is that it may be reinforcing the reward system addictive nature of cigarette smoking. And alcoholism in our biobank is the most common reward system phenotype that we have. So, so that's, that's one, one hypothesis for why we see this. We certainly see in, in other tissues different phenotypes, so the gastric ulcer. My hypothesis coming in was that this would be about inflammatory biology, um, and certainly this is potentially consistent with inflammatory biology. We certainly see in the lung, not the lung cancer, but some of the um, pulmonary embolism and acute pulmonary heart disease, which are also not surprising, and have, you have some continued risk for this for some period of time after you stop smoking. But we do, in some other tissues, pick up cancers within the respiratory system, cancer of the bronchus, um, uh, cancer of bone and connective tissue, cancer of the gums, uh, colorectal cancer and colon cancer, but also cancer of the mouth. So, that, and this is, these are, although they're listed by tissue, they're probably cell type specific signatures. That's one of the things um, we've learned more recently from GTEx data. And then just very quickly, just the pure phenome is really useful and interesting. It's astonishingly rich for discovery. You have diseases, biomarkers, drugs, outcomes, trajectories, comorbidities, correlation, onset versus progression. And so we've created, just from the 2.8 million subjects on whom we have long-term phenome, a set of subjects, 786,000 adults, 
um, curated for body mass index with a trajectory over at least five years of body mass index measurements, and then then curated metabolic phenotypes and cardiovascular phenotypes um, so that there's, and there are tools for, for viewing this, uh, that as soon as the first paper is published, people will be able to look at these data with respect to um, this, this set of phenotypes. And so just, just to give you a flavor of what you can do, you see increasing BMI, which are the colors here normal, overweight, obese one, two, and three, so um, different categories of BMI. This is the southeast of the United States, the most obese part of the country. You see increasing risk of metabolic dysregulation with increasing BMI across all age ranges until you get down here in the 90s. You see um, increased risk of hypertension that, again, attenuates uh, here. Similarly for diabetes, for low HDL, um, elevated triglycerides. And this um, attenuation in later ages is something that people have seen. Um, it reflects in part uh, the fact that some of the worst um, parts of this may lead to early death, so the people that survive into that age may not have as many of the genetic risk factors that, that would lead to this. But if you condition on the metabolic dysregulation that's actually observed, there's actually little effect of BMI. So every, all of the odds ratios here are, are calculated with respect to normal weight individuals with no metabolic dysfunction. And you can see that for atrial fibrillation, if you have, if you have no, no metabolic dysregulation as opposed to having some um, or all <laughs> metabolic dysregulation phenotypes, there's no, there's no increased risk for the normal way, the, for the, no matter how, how high the weight is, um, you really only see the increased risk in people with some level of metabolic dysfunction. And so that's true for atrial fibrillation. Um, it's, it's true for coronary artery disease, for heart failure, and myocardial infarction. So there's a lot of things that can be learned from just the phenome data. With that, I, I want to thank my colleagues and the, um, the funders, and happy to take questions. Hi, thanks Nancy for a lovely talk. I've got a couple of questions. One is, this CF example where it turned out that the QTLs were effectively just tagging the rare variants that you know to be driving the phenotype. I mean, how do you know that's not happening with a bunch of the oh, other no, no, associations? No, no, that was my point that, in showing right, the story. That it might I, be. We, we can't know until both of you get sequenced. Right. How much of what we're observing is exclusively the, the consequences of regulatory variation, how much is a combination of regulatory and coding variation, and how much might mostly be driven by the coding variation. And I would argue, I don't care, because there's no, there's no way that all of these people are homozygous for rare coding variants, and most of the um, disease conditions that, that would drive this are reported to be recessive uh, for the examples I gave. So there are just too many people showing associations to the related phenome um, outside, certainly outside CF, but to some extent inside CF, um, some carriers are contributing to the phenome associations we see not to cystic fibrosis, but to some of that other phenome. We remove CF patients. You can still see associations to some part of the phenome, more usually just the respiratory uh, part of the phenome. And so, so again, the combination of rare coding variants and maybe not even always regulatory variation at the same gene, but in important regulators of the gene, important uh, downstream targets of the genes, in different combinations may drive some of the unsolved rare cases, may contribute to 
the consequences of the biology of those genes driving much more medical phenome than has been appreciated. And I think it's a message that we really have to make clear to pharma who are often not investing in rare disease therapies because they think it'll affect too few people. But you really can't see associations like this in a biobank with people largely undiagnosed for any rare condition um, without their being bleed through to a lot of the features of these rare conditions. When, once you have the, the association demonstrated, if you, if you're in pharma or wanted to decide whether to pursue treatment strategies against that gene, how do you, how do you work out what proportion of the, 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 the causation of the condition is due to that genetic variant rather than environment or lots of other genes? So how do you move to quantifying the... So, so, so yeah, as we, as we have genome variation on more people, it would be possible to quantify that, but I would make the argument that in the same way that insulin is a fine therapy for diabetes and almost no one who takes it has a mutation in insulin, um, that the genes, the Mendelian drivers of rare disease are really central genes in the biology. Not all of them will be great drug targets, but when they are, it is unlikely that the, the therapies for those genes will be useful in only people who have mutations of those genes. And I, I mean, as I say, insulin is not a cause of most diabetes, but it is such a central player in glucose homeostasis that it is a fine therapy. And we have lots of examples like that. Many of the targets for oral agents in diabetes have either common coding mutations or regulatory variation that makes those genes um, signals in GWAS for type 2 diabetes. And their drug targets taken and effective in lots of people who don't necessarily have any genetic contribution from those genes because they're pretty central players in some key part of the biological process. That's what these discoveries are telling us, I think. So I, I had a quick question. Now, so, so to what degree can you take these, these phenotype risk scores and then go and feed that back into your medical system and identify yeah, yeah. and so, diagnose patients? And yeah, we're very interested in this concept. So the medical phenome associated to the monogenic forms of Alzheimer's disease, for example, is really interesting and predictive of, even when you take out Alzheimer's and all dementias, it is predictive of dementias, um, just the other medical phenome associated to, to what we see as the you know, genetically predicted expression of monogenic forms of Alzheimer's disease. So there's some fundamental biology there when a, no gene exists to cause Alzheimer's, right? They're, they're genes that have their everyday jobs, and when they don't do those jobs well enough over a lifetime and are failing on the way to increasing your risk for Alzheimer's, they're emitting signatures in the medical record. Um, increased risk of infections. Uh, we see uh, all kinds of much more benign evidence of neurodegeneration, peripheral neuropathies, for example. And so the using that could be a, a much richer target for discovery for Alzheimer's and related conditions. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for using principled ways, and people are doing it through the concept of pleiotropy, but that is what this essentially is. Um, another way of trying to discover the pleiotropic consequences of gene, genes where mutation, rare mutations with large effect can lead to what can also be a common disease. 
Um, a question about the Vactoral example. So we heard this talk last year at this meeting from Sally Dunwoody about these two genes, Mendelian actin genes causing this, but you noted that they were not anywhere near the top of your list. And so my, my question is, I mean, you shared all these nice examples of the genes whose genetically regulated expression was highly associated with the phenome risk score for Bacteril and how they happen to be associated with Mendelian phenotypes that shared some features. But how do you control for multiple testing? I mean, if you're just a big a whole bunch of, uh, you know, there are so many features of that syndrome. What's the chance? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Just... So, well, I, but we're only testing, um, we're testing that one phenome across the predicted expression of 20,000 genes. It, I mean, it, it's a phenotype. It's a, it's a, quantitative phenotype, I mean, it's effectively a phenome-based GWAS. Um, we're, we're using a phenome risk score instead of a particular disease. So the, I mean, we were looking at associations of a 10 to the minus 18, uh, 10 to the minus 20 with some of those genes, and you want to you wanna be at 10 to the minus 8 or better in, in, in the context of, you know, looking at, at 20,000 genes um, with predicted expression. So, I, I, I mean, yes, but a, any of those top genes met the criteria. I will say that those two other genes, if you look at loss of function mutations or coding variants in those genes, they seem to have stronger um, effects. And it, it's often the case that if a gene's expression is not very heritable, we don't get great signal um, for the genetically predicted expression, right? And so that, that's a contributing factor to these uh, to the power of the, the studies as well. <laughs> um, yeah, my point is partly that it seemed like these genes you were highlighting were a, had Mendelian disorders that involved some of the phenotypes, but not all in the score. And is it just that actually you're tagging coding variants and you know some of the people with high scores actually just have these other conditions? Well, um, no, no, no. So, well, um, so. They don't have the other conditions as diagnosed in the electronic health record. That doesn't mean they don't have them, um, but yes, they definitely could. But again, that, that's, uh, we could certainly build a phenome risk score for Miller syndrome, and my guess is, yes, that gene would, would come up. <laughs> um, thank you for this very inspiring talk. Um, I was wondering whether you have uh, effective ways to uh, curate the phenotypic data and the EHR records, and uh, also do you have uh, effective ways to mine the phenotypic data later on? Yeah, so um, the right way to think about electronic health records is that they're never going to be the same as the quality of data collected under research conditions, but it's uneven, not uniformly bad. Um, physicians don't try to misdiagnose patients. Um, and so, you know, we use a number of both simple and complex algorithms if we want to get to gold standard kinds of diagnoses for whatever condition. The, a physician gold standard diagnosis will reduce the number of patients um, that, that would meet your criteria by something in the range of 50 to 90 percent of patients, um, and yet doesn't always actually um, have a different relationship to known epicovariates. So um, we can often show that the e, you know, ICD-9 code, ICD-10 code diagnoses um, have the same relationship to known covariates as a physician uh, gold standard diagnosis where you lose 90% of your patients. So, so you have, because, and that's because for the gold standard diagnosis, the physicians want to see things that are not often in electronic health records. The, you know, but, but when they're there, they, they definitely indicate the patient has this disease. So, so what, we, what we always do is require for chronic diseases at least two codes on different days to instantiate a diagnosis. That really allows us to, to remove all of the rule out diagnoses that sometimes get a medical code because they ran all the testing to see if this person referred for lupus actually has lupus and they ruled it out. So 
by requiring multiple visits with the same diagnostic code, um, you, can, you can remove a lot of the rule out uh, codes. But there are lots of examples of phenotypes where the physician coded diagnosis, I mean, somebody's, if you're coded with a pelvic fracture, you probably had a pelvic fracture. If you're coded with type 1 diabetes in Tennessee, you got diabetes and nobody knows what kind of diabetes you have. So the, the kinds of data that we use in research to distinguish and be sure that when we're studying type 2 diabetes, we don't include any type 1s, or when we're studying type 1 diabetes, we don't include any type 2s, that's not collected in routine medical care. And for the most part, physicians don't care what kind of diabetes you have. They treat you with whatever works for that patient. And especially now when so many patients with type 2 take insulin and oral agents, and now more and more patients with type 1 take <laughs> insulin and oral agents, it's very hard from the medication lists to be sure. And even the age at onset at a tertiary medical center, we often don't have the data for because the patients come to us when they have complications and often multiple complications. And if you ask them, when did you develop diabetes? Oh, doc, I've had it forever. <laughs> so, that, you know. so we, so, and we have ways that we can deal with that. Um, if you're not doing genetic studies, the polygenic predictor for type 1 diabetes has such good AUC, you can use that very effectively to separate uh, patients. So there's a lot of things that can be done, um, at least in the subject to a genotype, to, for the hard cases. Very quick question. Thank you so much for your talk. I wonder, your title was Exploring the In-Between Spaces. So is that a good space? Should we all go there? Um, so I think... I don't know how much we all have to go there, but I would argue that the solve rate for Mendelian conditions, which has hovered in even the best places in the 40 to 50 percent range, means that to solve more of those cases, we might need to move at least partly into that space. Um, I think. I think we need to better document how much of medical phenome generically is attributable to the relatively small number of genes currently classified as Mendelian. Because, I, I, you know, based on our preliminary studies, there's no question that Mendelian genes accumulate more phen You can set whatever p-value threshold you want to set, whatever AUC you want to calculate, in terms of number of phenome uh, codes meeting any level of significance, Mendelian disease genes in the data we've analyzed to date accumulate more medical phenome, much more medical phenome than other genes. And we keep a list of genes that look like they will become. So Mendelian genes in waiting, we call them, because they have a lot of the same phenome associations and are just not yet reported out as Mendelian conditions. So, the, I think there, it's important to make people more aware of this, so not just people trying to solve, but also pharma, people thinking about therapies, and collectively, um, going forward, so as we get to bigger and bigger sample sizes, how, how well this holds up, um, and, and really quantifying, to the extent that we can, how much medical phenome may be driven by coding and non-coding variation related to these genes.